Uh, all right, welcome to Dr. Stabio's really high-tech review of neurophysiology. I tried to find you some YouTube videos, but all the ones I went through, and I spent way too much time on YouTube looking through these, I just didn't think they did a very... I, I, I was, like, more confused than I was helped when I looked at these. So I'm just going to use my daughter's um, art pad here and draw this out. So this is our... We're talking this week about... The chief concern this week is epilepsy, and we're talking about the physiology of neurons. We're returning to... Spend, we'll spend a lot of time on um, pharmacology. And so I thought it would be appropriate to review some of the material that we learned in foundational principles, which was a long time ago now. And so these are the terms that I'm going to talk about. So um, I want to talk about membrane properties of the neuron, capacitance, conductance, and the two gradients. And then I want to review all the different potentials, equilibrium potential, resting membrane potential, action potential, receptor potential, and synaptic potential. So we'll come back to this term sheet and check it off one at a time. Let's start with equilibrium potential. So to do that, we need to start with the membrane. So this is a cross section of a typical axon from a typical neuron. And if you remember that the membrane is made up of a bilipid layer, I'm not going to draw that because it'll take me 15 years, but all those little hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails, but you've got the idea. And the, um, the great thing about having a bilipid layer is that that lipid acts as a dielectric. In other words, that lipid acts as a non-conductive material. Remember, a capacitor is two electric conductive plates separated by a non-conductive material. And so in this case, the intracellular solution and the extracellular solution are the two conductive plates because they're salt water, right? Made up of charged ions. And the membrane acts as the lipid, the non-conductive material. So what that means is that you can store charge along the membrane, right? Because in a capacitor, you know, the charges are like hanging out here and the negative charges are hanging out here and they're like, I want to be with you. Unlike charges attract, I want to be with you. I want to be with you too, but we can't because of the space between us. And that's what the membrane does. And so you have capacitance. That's all I want you to take away from that. You can charge up, you can store up charge along the membrane. And then the second thing is that the membrane has conductance, right? Conductance is the opposite of resistance. Resistance is how hard it is to get through the membrane. Conductance is how easy it is to get through the membrane. They're the opposite of each other. So conductance equals one over R. All right, so what is, how, how do you get through the membrane? Well, you get through gates or pumps. And it's either leakage channels or voltage-gated ion channels or um, uh, ligand ion channels, you know, all sorts of different, different things. And there's specific channels in specific parts of the neuron, which makes it so intricate and so beautiful. But the main point here is that um, charges can get through. Now, at rest, when we're talking about equilibrium potential, we're talking about leakage channels. And so let's set up um, what the, what's, what's happening through the leakage channels. Which ion is greatest concentration on the inside? Hopefully you remember from six months ago, it's K, like circle K. So we have more um, potassium on the inside and a lower concentration of potassium on the outside. Uh, with sodium, you have a higher concentration of sodium on the outside and a lower concentration of sodium on the inside. Chloride, you have a higher concentration of chloride. Chloride just follows whatever sodium does, right? Salt, negative on the inside. And then you have calcium which is two plus on the outside, but you've got just a tiny little bit. So it's a pretty small concentration on the outside, but it's, it's negligent on the inside. And then you have these like large polyvalent anions that come from things like, I don't know, amino acids. And we're going to put those over here, but ignore them just a little for a minute. Now, what happens when you have a, a differential of ions one side to the other? You have a concentration gradient, and the concentration gradient for potassium is going to move potassium outside the cell. And as it goes down, so but the thing is, it's, it's not a neutral molecule. It's charged, and it's carrying charge with it. So every time a potassium ion comes out, it brings with it a positive charge and leads behind a negative charge. And it's going through leakage channels. That's the conductance, right? Conductance is high for potassium through the leakage channels. And so potassium comes through, we have positive charge here and negative charge here, a little more potassium here, and, and, it, and it leaves behind. So as it goes through the channel, it brings positive charge out and it leaves behind a negative charge. And that, as it goes down its concentration gradient, what's going to happen? Well, the positive charges building up because of the capacitance of the membrane on the outside are going to repel the potassium, push it back in, and you're going to and these negative charges that have built up are going to pull the potassium. So this now is the electrical, where this was the concentration or chemical gradient. And when those two are equal and opposite, that's when you reach equilibrium, and that's called the equilibrium potential. And it is red on the inside by convention. Okay, so it's what's the charge that builds up on the inside? So you can just do this exercise. You can always figure out the equilibrium potential. What's the charge on the inside of the membrane that's going to be balance the force of the concentration gradient? It, let's say you had 100 molecules, neutral molecules on the inside and zero on the outside. When would you reach equilibrium? It'd be when there's 50-50. But it's not in this case when it's 50-50 because of this charge that it carries with it. And so the equilibrium potential is the charge on the inside of the membrane that opposes um, the concentration gradient. So let's do the same for sodium. So sodium is greater on the outside. It's going to go in through the concentration gradient, but it carries with it a positive charge and it leaves behind a negative. And as sodium comes in, it brings a positive, leaves a negative, comes in another one, leaves, brings a positive, leaves behind a negative, comes in another one, leaves a positive, leaves behind a negative. 
what happens? You've built up positive charge here on the inside, right? So your concentration gradient for sodium is going in, but you have an electrical gradient that's pushing sodium back out again. And how do we label that? We label it based on the reading on the inside of the membrane. So what, what can we say so far? We can say so far that if we're going to plot this, this is zero millivolts. Ooh, this pen is bad. Zero millivolts. Up here, it's, it's going to be the equilibrium potential of sodium. And down here, way negative, is going to be the equilibrium potential of potassium. All right. This is like, I don't know, minus 80 millivolts. And this is like, I don't know, somewhere around what, plus 30. It's going to be depend on a lot of things, and we'll explore that. Um, so you write the equilibrium potential as E sub whatever ion it is. Now, what it, would it be for chloride? Chloride wants to go down its concentration gradient. It brings with it a negative charge. As it continues to go down, it goes, brings in more and more negative charges. What is it left behind? All of these positive charges, which are repelling. Um, so the constant, which these positive charges here are drawing chloride back in. So in this case, the concentration gradient is inward and the electrical gradient is kind of pushing. So these like charges repel, unlike charges attract, pushing chloride back out. And so what would the equilibrium potential of chloride be? Well, all you have to do is just read whatever it says on the inside, it's negative. And it has, and it's, you know, E chloride, it's down there. So, um, so remember, when anyone talks about equilibrium potential, they're talking about what the um, voltage of the inside of the axon would be if that ion were the only ion in the system. Okay, this is specific to sodium, specific to chloride, specific to potassium. So what does that do? What does it mean at rest? So who wins, right? Sodium wants the voltage inside the cell to be positive 30. Chloride wants it to be like minus 72, or something around there. Potassium wants it to be around minus 80. Who wins, right? They have this tug of war. Who wins? The person who wins, I'm anthropomorphizing ions, um, who, the, the winner is whichever ion can get through the membrane the easiest. In other words, whichever ion has the greatest conductance. So it happens to be that neurons are very leaky for potassium and they're not as leaky for sodium. Um, that's at rest. And remember, we have voltage-gated channels and they change the story. But at rest, we're only dealing with leakage and the membrane is leakier to, to potassium. And so the resting membrane potential is closer to potassium and ends up being somewhere around minus 65. My little drawing here is not to scale. But that's the resting membrane potential. <clears throat> And so what does that mean? This is what, you know, there's like a thermostat. I told you guys this analogy before. It's like a thermostat. Sodium wants it to be like, you know, really hot in the house and potassium wants it to be really cold in the house. And they're arguing over the thermostat. They're doing this tug of war and it ends up being sort of, you know, in, in down here closer to potassium. Well, potassium is very happy, right? It's like, wow, my driving force is very low. Driving force is what is sort of the force driving that ion to get the resting membrane potential towards its equilibrium potential. Whereas sodium's like, this is so unfair. You got way more. So it has a very high driving force, okay? So driving force is the distance. Mathematically, it's um, the resting membrane potential minus the equilibrium potential of sodium, right? That's driving force. I think that was one of the terms we wanted to review too, even though it's not written there. Now, so what does that mean? It means that if you do something to increase the conductance to sodium, sodium's going to go rushing into the cell. One, it's very negative inside. Sodium's dying to get in. It's like, let me in, let me in. And that's exactly what happens when you have some sort of depolarizing event. Um, you will open voltage-gated sodium channels, increase the conductance of the membrane to sodium, and the membrane potential goes flying up towards the equilibrium potential of sodium. And then what happens that as you're rising is then you, um, you start to increase the driving force on potassium. It's like, hey, I don't want the thermostat to be all the way up there. Bring it down, bring it down. And you open voltage-gated potassium channels, increase the conductance of the membrane to potassium, and you drive the membrane potential back down again, and you sort of overshoot. And this change, rapid change of about 100 millivolts in potential is called the action potential. It has a depolarizing phase here. It has a reversal at the top and it has a high, um, this is the repolarizing phase here and then a hyperpolarizing phase when it overshoots. All right, so we've gone over equilibrium potential. This is the potential as if sodium were the only ion in the system. What would sodium want the membrane potential to be on the inside? Okay, the equilibrium potential for potassium. What would the membrane potential be on the inside if the potassium were the only ion in the system? They have to figure out how to get along, and they, the person who wins is the one who carries around the most weight, and the weight is the conductance, whoever, whichever one has the, can get through the membrane the easiest, and that membrane is leakiest, potassium. So the membrane potential is close to potassium, close to the equilibrium potential of potassium. And the action potential, so this is at rest. So what's the membrane potential at rest when you consider all the ions in the system? And this is what happens when you reach threshold. 
um, the ion goes through this 100 millivolt change in depolarization that's driven by an inward sodium current on the depolarizing phase and an outward potassium current on the repolarizing and hyperpolarizing phase. All right, so we've done equilibrium potential. We've done resting membrane potential. We've done action potential. Now the last two are receptor potential and synaptic potential. What are these? So these are small potentials that are sub-threshold. What do I mean by sub-threshold? That means that there is a threshold value. Let's draw this a little bit better. Here's E and A, here's E, K, here's zero, here's E, no, nah, that's too close, E chloride, and this is resting membrane potential. All right, so when there has, there's a threshold, which is a certain voltage that causes um, changes in the um, conformational arrangement of the sodium channel. And when you get to a certain voltage, that conformational change has caused the channel to open and it's only selected to sodium ions. And so this threshold is when you reach enough depolarizations to trigger an action potential, all right? Back down, like that. I'm not very good at drawing to scale, all right? Um, the main point is that what happens between this space and this space, there's gonna be small little changes in membrane potential. And we'll talk about this more on Monday depolarizing, repolarizing, depolarizing, repolarizing. They will not trigger an action potential. You actually have to sum them up, you know, collect all your money from everyone in the neighborhood to make enough money to reach threshold. And these are these are called sub-threshold because they're below threshold. And they are called graded potentials, or they're sometimes called local potentials because they're small little changes. And here is your synapse, and you release neurotransmitters because of the action potential that comes down. And those neurotransmitters bind to a receptor, which is attached to a channel that opens a channel. Right? These are not voltage-gated channels. These are neurotransmitter-gated channels. In this case, it's a ligand-gated ionotropic channel. That causes a little bit of positive current coming in. Let's call it sodium. And that's going to lead to a small little depolarization at the synapse. Right? So that's called a synaptic potential. Right? Now, when you have this sort of... That's synaptic potential. Now, the same sort of thing happens at receptors. So in the case of like, that's like um, a photoreceptor, which we'll talk about more in week four, there's light that shines and that photon energy causes conformational changes in a, in a cyclic GMP gated aid, which ultimately results in a tiny little change. In this case, it's hyperpolarizing current in, in the photoreceptor, right? That's called a receptor. It's just, again, potential is change in voltage that occurs at the receptor. We're not talking about um, the receptors on a channel. We're talking about receptors in the sensory system, like um, somatosensory receptors, photoreceptors, uh, olfactory receptors, taste receptors, etc. All right, so that gets us through our terms. And of course, we did already do concentration gradient and electrical gradient. Um, so let me show you one more thing that kind of sums everything up, and that is this flow diagram. So when you hear the term potentials, I want you to think about change difference in voltage on the inside of the membrane versus the outside of the membrane. You have different types of potentials. If you're at rest, you have resting membrane potential, that's RMP. Upon stimulation, it's gonna depend, okay? Whether, where you are with respect to threshold. If you hit threshold, you're getting an action potential and it's all or none, right? A huge action potential like that. If you're sub-threshold, you're gonna get a small um, graded potential, which is oftentimes called a local potential. And depending on where you are, they have different names. If you're in um, the, at the synapse, and you're measuring the voltage change on the postsynaptic cell, you're gonna call that an excitatory postsynaptic potential or an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. We'll talk about that on Monday more. If you're in a receptor cell, like photoreceptor, olfactory receptor, pain, free nerve ending for um, nociceptor in the pain pathway, or you're in a um, Pacinian corpuscle or Meissner's, you know, or you, the, the change that you get from the energy conversion from like a photon to a voltage change, that's called a receptor potential, okay? So we'll do more of this uh, on Monday. All right, the next thing I want you to do is to download the Nernst Goldman Simulator. This is something that I um, showed you in Foundations, Foundational Principles course. Um, it was originally built with the Flash player, but that's no longer supported by Adobe, and so all Flash things have kind of disappeared. So, um, and it was made by University of Arizona, so what they did is actually make an app that you can download. Um, so you go to the App Store, and it's for free, and you can download it. And what it enables you to do is um, to manipulate equilibrium potential of ions, which is in the Nernst category here, and the resting membrane potential, which is the Goldman. So there's two equations. The Nernst equation is the calculation of equilibrium potential, which we just did conceptually. It's important to me that you know it conceptually. I'm not gonna ask you to calculate it or to memorize the equation. The Goldman is the equation for the resting membrane potential. And you can manipulate extracellular potassium, extracellular sodium, 
and um, the temperature. And this actually, this temperature one is really interesting. So if you're able, please go ahead and download that and it will give you an idea of these two equations. This is not something that I will test you on. Like I won't ask you to calculate either one of these with the, from the equation.